At that moment, high over the vast Pacific, the nuclear airship Grand Eagle hung motionless in the air. A wounded giant with one of its great double propellers mangled beyond use. The enormous airship was drifting very slowly but steadily off course, and there was only the sound of the wind to break the silence that engulfed it. On the command deck, there was a flurry of activity. Crew members continued to check and double-check emergency evacuation equipment and procedures. If for any reason it should become necessary to abandon the Grand Eagle, there were parachutes and paragliders stowed in the compartments surrounding the lower emergency hatch, directly below the command deck's forward section. Inflatable life rafts were also there for ditching at sea, and they were equipped with provisions and radio beacons. General Smalley stood before the main television monitors at the front of the command deck's control center, surveying the damage to the propeller on one of the screens. The camera that afforded the view was mounted just behind the top fin of the immense craft, its lens peering through a clear blister. Next to Smalley stood Colonel Curtis and Senior Flight Officer Stuart Gardner. The image on the screen showed the damage clearly. The first propeller of the double set was the one that had been hit. Each normally had three blades radiating out from its hub, but the first now was missing two, with only the shattered stubs remaining. I know we'd planned for this possibility, Smalley was saying, but if either of you have any doubts that we can manage it, now's the time to speak up. Curtis considered it briefly, eyes still on the television image. No, sir, I think we can do it. Under the present circumstances, it's going to be risky, but I don't think we have any choice. All right, Smalley agreed, but we'd best get started. Yes, sir, I've already alerted the repair crew. They're on their way now. As Curtis made a final check on equipment status, Stuart Gardner conferred briefly with his two junior officers at the helm of the great airship, then turned and started out of the control center. As he reached the outer hull heading for the elevator, Staff Sergeant Elizabeth Jordan caught up with him. Colonel? Gardner turned and faced her. Yes, Beth? For a moment, the young woman looked at Gardner's expressionless features, afraid to speak. Then finally, she said, Do you have to go up in the helicopter? Yes, of course. Look, the general needs Colonel Curtis here with him. If those Russians should try anything else, we need the top command officers right here on deck. Besides, as long as we're stalled, there's not much I can do at the helm. Out there, I can at least see what has to be done. Supervising the repair is my responsibility. I know, but... She hesitated. It's just that I know the risk involved, working so close to the ship. If a gust of wind should blow the helicopter against the top fin, that shouldn't happen. The air current should be pretty steady. As he started to turn again, Elizabeth Jordan reached out and touched his arm. He looked at her hand upon his sleeve, and for a brief instant... There was the recollection of his wife's hand touching him that way. It was a memory that hurt. What is it, Beth? I, Colonel, she said, suddenly uncertain of herself, but having to try. Stuart, be careful. She had never called him by his first name before, and he was not prepared for the note of personal concern in her voice. Of course I'll be careful. I care too much about the ship to foul things up. I just, I just wish you'd care more about yourself, she said softly, abruptly turning away from him and heading quickly back down the hall to the control center. Gardner hurried on into the elevator and started down to deck C. He had an uncomfortable feeling there was something he should have said to reassure her, but he had no idea what it might have been. The feeling still nagged at him as he reached deck C, but he forced it from his mind. He quickly passed between the two storage bays and entered the corridor stretching back toward the middle of the airship, trotting along its 270-foot length. The car of the main elevator was waiting, and he took it up to the top of the hull, emerging in the upper missile room. From there, it was only a short way to the helicopter hangar. As he entered that chamber, he saw four of the ship's flight mechanics busily unloading cables and releasing two replacement rotor blades from their mountings along the hangar wall. The propeller blades were made of a tough, reinforced honeycomb material, just as the helicopter's own blades were, but despite their relatively light weight, 
it still took three of the mechanics working together with a pneumatic lift to position the blades where the cables could be attached. Gardner headed for the helicopter pilot and co-pilot who were already suited up and putting on their flight helmets. Approaching Captain Lee, he said, Have you got the procedure down? Yes, sir. By the book, Lee replied, making a final adjustment on his flight uniform. But to tell the truth, I feel a lot better in my jet than I feel in that whirlybird. I know, Gardner said. But you knew the Harrier crew would have to double as helicopter jockeys when you signed up for this project. No complaints, sir, Lee said with a trace of a grin. The chief mechanic approached, examining the fastenings on a special harness. Concern etched his rough-hewn features. I sure hope whoever designed this thing knew what he was doing, the man said. Have you checked the cables? Gardner asked. Yes, sir. First thing. All right. Let's get it going. Gardner quickly stepped up into the Bell UH-1N helicopter and fastened a lightweight harness around his waist, one secure to the inner framework of the ship. Picking up a spare flight helmet, he put it on and adjusted the position of the microphone before his lips. He gave a signal to one of the flight mechanics, and the man activated the hangar doors above, watching as the large panels rolled aside along their channels. Raw daylight poured in, for the sun was nearly directly overhead. In the next instant, the lift platform that supported the helicopter started up, raising the small craft to a position above the airship's outer surface. As soon as it was locked into position, the pilot released the rotor lock and started the engines. The clamps that held the craft tight to the lift platform were not released until the rotor was whirling at just above idle speed and everything seemed stable. Then with a loud snap, the clamps freed their grip and the helicopter hovered above the open hangar, shifting slightly as the pilot readjusted for the air currents playing across the top of the airship. Cables dangled down into the hangar's interior, and one of them was fastened to the first replacement propeller blade, fixed at its center of gravity, with a special bracket which gripped the blade's edges. The second cable reached down to the harness worn by the chief mechanic, and as Gardner waved a signal at him, the man took up a position near one end of the 30-foot-long blade. It was an awkward and risky procedure, but the only one found to work well in static tests on the surface of the desert at Edwards Air Force Base. To keep the long rotor blade from turning uncontrollably as it was being moved, the mechanic had to grip with his arms and legs the end that was to be connected to the propeller hub. With his own cable in effect steadying the blade, he could guide it into position. Beginning the ascent with the utmost care, the pilot brought his helicopter higher, raising the dangling blade and mechanics slowly out of the hangar. A radio-equipped flight helmet protected the mechanic's head from the force of the downdraft and put him in contact with the helicopter crew. On the back of his harness was a tank of compressed air, with a hose leading to a pneumatic wrench hooked to his belt. As the helicopter drifted back, past the brilliant reflections from the Grand Eagle's upper surface, the waters of the Blue Pacific came into view nearly a mile below. Steady as she goes, sir, the mechanic's voice rasped in Gardner's helmet. It's a long drop. Swinging there at the end of the cable, wind whistling past his helmet, and dazzling sunlight barely suppressed by his visor, the mechanic fought to keep the end of the blade within his grip. Above him, the helicopter appeared to be dangerously close to the airship's massive top fin. Even a brief contact with the spinning rotor blades could send the helicopter plummeting down to the sea below. Above him, Gardner leaned partway out the open door of the craft, peering down at the dangling man. Moving slowly toward the pointed end of the airship, the blade was nearly in position next to the first propeller hub. The remaining intact blade had ended up pointing down, so fortunately the shattered sections were in a relatively good position for the approach. But for some reason, the pilot appeared to be having trouble keeping the craft in position above the hub. Gardner spoke into his helmet mic. What's the problem? Can't you keep it steady? The pilot's voice came back. It's hard, sir. The airship is drifting quite a bit. The wind isn't affecting us as much as it's going to be tricky staying with it. We're going to have to. I know, sir. 
There was a slight pause. It would be easier if we were both heading into the wind. Gardner considered it, estimating the airship's capabilities in its current state, virtually without forward propulsion power. Or was it? Gardner switched to the main ship's channel and contacted the communications console. Elizabeth Jordan's voice answered, Beth, switch me through to the helm, quickly. Yes, sir. There was a certain flatness to her voice, and Gardner wondered briefly if he'd said or done anything to hurt her feelings. The thought vanished as one of his junior officers replied, Here, sir. I want you to get the thrusters to head the ship into the wind. Clear it with the general. At once, sir. There was a brief pause, then the man's voice returned. We have the general's go-ahead, beginning 45-degree turn to the west, commencing in 15 seconds. Gardner switched back to the helicopter's communications channel. Captain, take us up, clear the tail. The ship's turning. Follow it around into the wind, and for our mechanic's sake, keep it steady. Will do, sir. Gardner braced himself as the helicopter rose slightly, moving clear of the aft end of the great airship. No sooner had they reached a safe position than the turbo thrusters located at the top and bottom of the airship's ends revved up. The ones near the nose directed their force to the port side, the rear thrusters to the starboard side. Gradually, the immense craft began to turn, pivoting as it slowly swung around into the wind. But even with its reduced profile, there was still too much drift. Gardner said to the pilot, Get us back in position. He switched back to the ship's channel. Helm, is General Smalley near your console? Right here, sir. Putting him on. Smalley's easily identifiable drawl came through his helmet. What is it, Gardner? Sir, I'd like to start the secondary turbines, the ones that suck in the boundary layer air. I think the air being expelled through the vents at the rear might exert enough force to keep the ship from drifting. There was silence for a moment. It might work, but there's going to be some turbulence back there if we do. Most of it will be under the stern, away from us. All right, it's worth a try. Gardner instructed the junior officers at the helm to key the control circuits for separate operation of the secondary turbines, then waited for those orders to take effect. It did not take long. With a faintly audible whine, the two smaller turbines, each with a thousand horsepower, started up, forcing air pulled in through the outer surface of the hull, out from vents just beneath the horizontal fins. But as their power increased, an unexpected side effect placed them in sudden danger. The force of the expelled air moving across the airship's propellers started them turning, like a breeze across the blades of a fan. The hub only turned a partial revolution before locking again, but in that turn, one blade of the secondary propeller sliced dangerously close to the dangling mechanic, barely brushing the end of the replacement rotor. Gardner fairly yelled into his microphone, Freeze that turbine! I don't want those propellers spinning on us back here! Working on it, sir, his junior officer reported back. There's a maintenance technician in the aft end checking for damage. Well, tell him to secure the locking brakes manually, if necessary. But rotate the hub electrically first to bring the two damage blades up into position again. Roger. They waited, high above the wind-tossed waves, until the propeller hubs had been returned to the proper position. Once they had, and Gardner had been assured the turbine was locked, he directed the helicopter pilot to move in slowly, using the copter like a flying crane to lower the new blade into place. Reaching out to steady himself as the propeller hub drew near, the suspended mechanic worked himself into a position where he could reach the mounting brackets that held the old damage blade section secure. The brackets themselves were nearly as large as a man's torso, they were fastened permanently to the hub with large bolts that would unscrew far enough to permit the bracket to release the blade end. The end of the replacement blade was resting on the narrowing end of the hull now, and the mechanic braced his knees against the reinforced surface. Bringing the pneumatic wrench around to the bolts on the hub brackets, he began to turn them out one by one. The damaged blade shifted slightly, repositioning itself as the pressure upon it was released. When the last bolt had been backed out and the bracket was clear, the mechanic braced himself more firmly and reached out with one foot, kicking at the end of the old blade. Shuddering briefly, the propeller section sprang free of the mounts that had held it in and tumbled end over end toward the sea. 
It almost disappeared from view before reaching the ocean surface. The mechanic gave a slight shudder of his own, then said into his helmet mic, Take us up a little, sir. Gardner did not have to relay the message, but he watched alertly as the pilot moved the helicopter slightly higher, allowing the replacement blade to raise above the mounting bracket. The blade came up level, the mechanic still gripping one end even as he himself dangled from a cable. Gardner estimated the angle needed to bring the end of the blade into position against the hub, then carefully activated the electric winch that controlled the cable connected to the man's harness. Slowly feeding out line, the mechanic's weight gradually brought the end of the new blade lower, nearing the hub. Great skill and caution had to be exercised in the next step, for if the mechanic made a wrong move, allowing the blade end to slip too quickly into the recessed spot behind the mounting bracket, his hand could easily become pinned between the titanium aluminum surfaces. Pinned or worse? The blade end had to mesh precisely within the bracket's opening, or else the mounting device would not clamp down and secure the blade. Grasping a handhold on the outer surface of the large propeller hub, the man pulled himself and the blade closer still, carefully guiding the end into position. When at last he was certain that it was set and caught, he brought the pneumatic wrench back around and began tightening the bolts. He double-checked each one before releasing his hold on the hub. It's a cure, Colonel, the man's voice came over Gardner's helmet earphone. Move me out a little, I'm going to release the blade cable. Working his way along the length of the new blade, he reached out for the device that secured the cable. The clamps that gripped the blade were geared to a central point where a shaft protruded. Slipping the air wrench over the end of the shaft, he triggered it, causing the clamps to extend and free the blade. His work done? The mechanic reclipped the wrench to his belt and grasped the loose cable and clamp, carrying it along as Gardner activated the winch, reeling him back up to the helicopter. As he finally reached the open hatch and climbed into the cabin, Gardner helped him aboard and gave him a grateful slap on the back. Perfect. No one could have done it better, Gardner told him. The man raised the visor on his helmet and used his sleeve to blot away the sweat on his face. Thanks, sir. Now I guess we'd better get back to the hangar and pick up the other blade. On the command deck, General Smalley seemed visibly relieved that at least one of the replacement blades was now secure. Near him, Paul Brandon studied the image on the television monitor with a certain grim awe. That's not the kind of job you'd want to do often, Brandon told him. We didn't expect to, Smalley replied. The useful life of one of those blades is normally enough to last until a routine maintenance visit at the base. Once we begin our regular patrols, we won't be making return visits often. The remark reawakened Brandon's interest in the true purpose of the airship. Patrols? he said. Smalley looked at him for a moment, perhaps wondering if there was any harm in discussing the purpose of the program. Come on, he said finally. There's something I'll show you. The general led him back, beyond the doors of the control center, to the first compartment on the left, the space that served as both office and private quarters for the Grand Eagle's commanding officer. The compartment was tidy and its furnishings simple and well-ordered. There was only one bunk and one locker, leaving more wall space for a medium-sized desk. On that desk was a small model of the airship encased in a plexiglass box, secured to the desktop and the walls bore numerous photos of past commands and a few prints of old airships. Smalley gestured toward a wall map depicting the world. Sectors had been marked off, dividing the sea and land areas into near equal amounts. The Grand Eagle, Smalley began, is more than just my private dream, although I must confess this old farm boy has been dreaming about airships since the days when they still used hydrogen. No, it's much more than that. It's the prototype of a whole squadron of such craft to be built at our home base in California, if testing on this one works out as expected. Why so many? Brandon asked. To cover a wide area. With at least six of these craft on regular patrol around coastal areas, there will always be tactical aircraft available for use at a moment's notice, almost anywhere we might need them. Also, 
defensive missiles for use against enemy aircraft or rockets that might be used against the United States or any of our territories or our allies. And above all, a series of airborne command posts that almost never have to touch the ground or refuel. A complete control center with more electronics gear, computer systems, and radar systems than you could ever put in a conventional aircraft. Complete facilities for relaying on-the-spot information back home. And if necessary, we can stay back out of range of a hotspot and let our RPVs do the work for us. In anything this large and slow-moving, wouldn't you be an awful easy target? No more so than a remote land-based installation, Smalley replied confidently. Besides, for anything to bother us, they have to get within range first. The Grand Eagle may be big as a dinosaur, but it also has teeth. Brandon took it all in with interest. Even if he was not greatly interested in military matters, he could still see the potential of such craft. And let's not forget emergency missions like this one, he suggested. Exactly, Smalley said. And when we're not concerned about extra payload, we can normally carry heavy equipment, which can be used to clear an airstrip in a remote area so that regular, heavier-than-aircraft can go in. And there is one other consideration. What's that? The fact that we're steadily losing air bases around the world, Smalley said soberly. We have only a few in Asia right now, and there are several in Europe which may be removed. Of course you've heard about Portugal and the Azores base. I'm not saying that far-ranging nuclear airships are going to be the answer to our problems, but they will be a valuable addition. And with this prototype completed now, the cost of the next ones will go down considerably. Civilian applications are inevitable. Brandon reflected, remembering some of his own aspirations and dreams. I'm beginning to understand your enthusiasm, General, and I rather envy your ability to achieve what you want. That's no small accomplishment in itself, believe me. It took a while. I knew something like this project, this ship, was inevitable. I'm just glad I lived to see it. Brandon smiled back, beginning to understand just how much the Grand Eagle meant to Smalley. They headed out of the compartment, starting for the control center. Thank you, General, Brandon said sincerely. For what? For letting me in on all this. Smalley acquired a wry look. Well, Doctor, I reckon if the government can trust you with Lorenz's life, I can trust you with a small bit of classified information. Brandon faked ignorance. What information is that? Grinning broadly, Smalley slapped him on the back. You got the picture, Doc. Come on, let's get back and see how they're doing with the repairs. It was 1.55 p.m. when the second replacement blade was finally installed and checked, and the helicopter was back safely within its hangar. Heads turned on the command deck as Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Gardner pushed through the double doors at the rear of the control center and walked quickly to the helm. General Smalley intercepted him. Good work, Stuart. Your idea about using the secondary turbines cut our drift rate almost to nothing. We could have been a lot further off course than we are. How are the rotors? Are we in flying shape again? Yes, sir, Gardner told him. But if we have to go through that again, we may just have to recruit a new chief mechanic. Don't worry, nobody's going to get that close a second time. He turned to Colonel Curtis. John, have Tate put our defense systems on ready alert. If anything else lifts off the Keeves deck, it's going to have one deuce of a time getting near us. I don't want them close enough for a good visual sighting. Understood, sir. Curtis replied, then headed his tall and lanky form toward the weapons systems officer to relay the order. Stuart Gardner was slipping into the senior flight officer's seat, wasting no time in putting the Grand Eagle's flight circuitry back on operational status. At the touch of a button, servos at the rear of the ship released the braking locks that had held the rotor shaft immobile. He carefully checked the display screens which showed the status of the turbines and the reactor readings. Everything seemed in order. Gardner slipped on his operations headset and announced to the others. Leaving stable hold. Prepare for 45 degree turn. He watched as the computers quickly flashed the necessary information on his screen, filling in the flight data for resuming course to Tongariva. Fingers crossed, he keyed in the electronic commands to start the main turbine. Looking up at the monitor in the bank overhead, he watched the image as the giant twin propellers began to spin. When he was sure they were going to function without further problems, he brought their speed up to full power, simultaneously adjusting the angle of the ship's rudder planes. 
the view from the huge main window of the control center began to swing about to the right as the immense airship began to move forward, its control surfaces bringing it back in line with a south-southwesterly line of flight. Gardner checked the airspeed indicator, encouraged as the digital readout continued to increase. It would take perhaps another 10 minutes before they were at maximum cruising speed, but it would not take long after that to overtake and pass the Soviet aircraft carrier that was still plowing through the ocean ahead. Gardner turned to Smalley, who was still standing nearby. We're back in business, sir. Underway and approaching normal speed. Smalley stared out at the horizon intently. Outstanding. I guarantee you're going to reach that island. And if the Russians think we're going to be an easy mark the next time, then they've got another thing coming. 